So uh, if everyone's ready, I'll go ahead and turn it over. We've got Shipple's own Carrie Gale and Katrina Esco. Thank you, Tabby. My name is Carrie Gale, and this is uh, my co-partner, Katrina Esco. I've been with Shipple for five years. I started off as a team member, and I was a project manager for a couple of years, and now I'm the manager of the support team at Shipple. And I'm excited to be here at ShippleCon 2011. Yay. Um, talking about tips and hacks and the three stages of website management. Um, my esteemed co-partner <laughs> here, Katrina Esco, I'll let her uh, introduce herself. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Jay. I'm Katrina Esco. I've been with Shipple for a little more than a year. I started as an intern at Shipple. I I'm official founder of Shippolites, L-I-G-H-T, means loosely employed Shippolites. No. Um, <laughs> She's that's what you are when you're an intern, but I'm definitely employed now, like for real, for real. Um, <laughs> prior to Shippol, I worked as a PR consultant for Ogilvy Public Relations and a local PR firm specializing in consumer product and building online, or building brand strategies, so branding strategies, rather. So, yes, I'm excited about our um, panel today. Carrie will probably tackle the more technical stuff as a support manager, and I'll be more on the user end of it. Sure. Um, let's go ahead and dive in. Um, we're going to talk about the three stages of website management. Um, first one being either you're in the stage where you have a new website, or you don't have a website, or you have an existing website, and you're working on getting a new website. Uh, we're going to go over what you can plan for and expect to encounter whenever your site goes live and if you need assistance. And then we're going to close with some recommendations, tips, and or hacks about how to effectively manage your website. Our presentation is littered with lol cats um, and robots. Um, so I hope you guys enjoy it. <laughs> First, let's uh, talk a little bit. I feel like I need to stand up because <laughs> I don't like being. Uh, trapped behind this table. So working with somebody to get a site, what's important to know. If you are at a stage where you don't have a website or you're working with somebody to get a website built, these are the things that you're going to need to consider. Um, it's going to involve either designing the look or the layout of the website. That's going to require your approval. Um, you're going to have to consider what you're going to do with the content. Do you need to create content? Do you have existing content that needs to be uh, migrated over to this new website? Um, then you're going to have to consider the software that you're going to use for your website. We just heard a fantastic uh, presentation by Dries on Drupal, um, which is one of the content management websites. I'm going to move over to the mic. <laughs> uh, that uh, you can definitely engage with. Um, there's plenty of open source, thank you, Brad. Plenty of open source software that you can also engage with, and of course, uh, Shipple provides Tendency, which is another uh, platform that you can use. Regardless of what platform you use, you're gonna need to learn how to use the software as part of your planning stage, and um, consider the time that it's gonna take for, for learning and moving the content. One of the other things that you need to consider is the actual build out of the website. So if you are working to get a new website with a new layout, that's going to take time to actually build and implement onto your content management system or whatever platform you choose. Uh, and you need to plan uh, time-wise for these types of additions and changes. That's going to be part of the site construction component. The other component has to do with the content uh, and the search engine optimization of the content. And you want to make sure that you're aware and considering these factors right from the beginning because this is going to be the most critical part of reaching your community and making sure that your website uh, meets its business goals for you or your organization. Search engine optimization can be as simple as making sure that the topics or keywords that you want to be found for by Google or any of the other search engines actually appear as content on your website. So if you're running a website for an animal shelter, um, you want to make sure that the words that are associated with your website have to do with animals, dogs, and rescue, um, and not necessarily to do with things that may, people may not uh, associate with your organization. Um, I can give the example of a particular client that we had that dealt with uh, the Bible. And 
they were uh, optimized for selling of the Bible and the, the products that they were selling, um, but they wanted to be, they wanted to know why they were not coming up whenever you would search for the word God. But there was nowhere on their website that the word God actually appeared, um, and it's extremely hard to optimize uh, for that word, and our search engine marketing manager is in the back smiling at me because she's familiar with that uh, anecdote. Um, other things that you want to consider before you go live with your website um, is you want to do a quality check of your website. Um, you want to make sure that the content is correct, free from spelling and grammatical errors, and uh, all the links work and all the images are correct. And this can sound very mundane, and if you've been working strongly with your website, um, throughout the development process, you're kind of blind to what's on the website. So we oftentimes recommend that you get somebody else who's not really familiar with the content to kind of review it um, with fresh eyes so they can see if there's anything weird or it doesn't flow or the links are not working or the, um, something is not right, then they can bring it to your attention and you can resolve it before you actually go live and launch your, your bright new shiny website. Um, so those are the recommendations that we uh, make for the, I guess, the development process, um, either with a brand new website or you're changing your website. And then the next step um, after you've done the quality assurance and made all the necessary changes is to actually take your site live, which is one of my favorite parts because it's technical and I like all those technical bits. Um, Katrina is going to cover a little bit more about the post go live and the content management um, aspect of that. Um, so DNS is sexy. That's what the robot says. I agree with the robot. So one of the things that you need to consider is, okay, now you've got this set website. It's ready to go live. You need to consider the take live process and what that entails. Um, from a technical standpoint, you're either going to be engaging with um, your, your company or whoever's providing you the website service to move the website, which isn't going to include like the, the database or the images or the, the content from one server to another and then you're going to need to make DNS changes. And DNS stands for Domain Name System, and that's what controls whenever you type in a domain um, or URL such as Microsoft.com on your browser, that's what brings up the website. So if you're going to be moving servers for your website, you need to have access to your DNS in order to make updates to point the domain to the new website on the new server. This is a critical a thing, a critical point, and if you don't have access to your DNS, um, everything stops. Um, a lot of times you may have engaged with a, a company previously to create your website and they may have registered your domain name and inadvertently registered under themselves, so you're not the legal owner of the domain. That can be a problem if your, your previous company doesn't play nice and doesn't want to release the domain. Uh, you always you're going to have to go through hoops to prove to the registrar that you are the legal and rightful domain owner to transfer it out from under that company. But in most cases, you're not going to have that problem. Just be aware that when you get started with the website management uh, process, you need to think about being able to access your DNS information. A lot of times we find with organizations that somebody in the organization will register the domain and then the board changes and that person is lo no longer part of the organization and they don't have access to that person's email and they can't get into the uh, domain registrar to be able to make changes. And so these are things that can slow down the process. Um, DNS is quite important. One of the other things that uh, you want to consider is um, once you have moved the site over, you've made DNS changes, you have to wait a while for DNS to propagate before you'll be able to access the website, the new website at the domain. And this can take anywhere for, from a couple hours to up to 72 hours. And once you're able to see the website at the domain, that means everybody else can see it too. So you want to do a post uh, DNS change, uh, quality checklist again to make sure, are the images showing up, are the links working, are you receiving the contact form submissions if you have a contact form on your website, and just make sure that everything is working properly 
um, before you go to town with making announcements to let everybody know that, hey, we have a new website. You guys need to come out and see it. It's fantastic. And uh, involving your community uh, with the announcement of your website. So there's a couple things that I wanted to talk about with the post uh, go live marketing. You want to remember the first thing, the most important thing is to wait for DNS before you start announcing on Facebook and Twitter. Um, you may see it really quickly, uh, but your community or your organization or your, your, your visitors may not be able to see it. I have a screenshot from a client of Shipple's um, the Texas Renaissance Festival, and Gina's actually speaking right now in the other room. Gina? Uh, they were really excited to go with, to announce their new website, and uh, they had a countdown and a whole campaign going on Facebook, and the day that they went live and made DNS changes, um, as soon as DNS changes were made, they announced it on Facebook. And people were in a frenzy, wanting to see the new website and some folks couldn't see it and so they were commenting on their Facebook, hey I still see the old, old one with the new website coming soon message and uh, Texas Renaissance Festival were responding, oh you need to close out your browser, clear your cache, type in the URL and all these kind of things that you really don't want to have to explain to your site visitors because they don't care, they just want to see the new website. They don't care why it's not working. It's not working that means you must have done something wrong. Um, so you do want to wait and hold on that. And then once, I would say, recommend again, for DNS changes anywhere between 24 to 72 hours. Then once you're confident that DNS is propagated across the internet, you can start making announcements. You can uh, announce on Facebook, send out tweets. Um, you can, if your website allows it, to send out email notifications, inviting people to come and view the new website. Uh, with instructions on how to use the website if there's any special features like, oh, now you can log in and this is how you log in, or now you can uh, view our calendar and register for events. And you can also post welcome content on your website instructing people um, on any new features that the new website may have, if it has uh, um, calendar events, or if you can register for uh, special functions, or if you can now join as a member, or if you can renew your membership, whereas before you had to submit a fax or something like that. Uh, give them instruction and guidance on how to use their new website. Uh, congratulations, it's a website. So the next thing that you're probably gonna be considering or having to uh, uh, contend with once you have gone live with your new website is you're gonna have questions. You've got a new website, you're nervous, it's a new software, um, people are asking you how do I log in, how do I use it, uh, you're, you, you're, it's a bit of a, an emotional um, thing to go live with a new website and Having worked with uh, numerous clients, we understand that it's a, it's a stressful time for everyone. For <laughs> you, because it's your website, and for the people who created your website as well, they want to make sure that everything is working properly. Part of the development process, you would have learned a little bit about how to use your software, um, and the best way to learn how to use the software is to practice on your website. To practice using it, adding content, adding images, adding links, um, linking out to different things. Uh, if it has new components that you're not familiar with, practice using those components. Um, the other thing that you can do is if you are unsure of how to do certain things, you can reach out to your organization internally or go online to look for uh, online resources that may uh, exist. Uh, Dries was talking about Drupal. There's a huge online Drupal community that uh, you can reach out to. Uh, if you have a WordPress website, you can reach out to WordPress or even Google. How do I um, export my subscribers in WordPress? Uh, if, even if you're not a technical-minded person, you will be able to find the answers. And even if you don't understand the answer right off the bat, uh, you can try it and see how it works. If all of this fails, you can always reach out to the people who created your website uh, for technical assistance. A lot of times they'll offer free training. Um, a lot of times they'll offer free support or support is billable. Um, but you definitely have a community out there that you can reach out to 
uh, to learn how to use your website. And the most important thing is if you do need technical support, um, you know, there are places where you can go and people that you can turn to uh, to get the answers that you need. If something terrible happens on your website and you do need to reach out to a professional for technical support, um, you want to make sure that you give as much detail as possible to the people that you're trying to reach out to help for. Um, Katrina can jump in at any time. Uh, you want to make sure that your request includes a link. Um, if there's a specific, if it's happening in a specific browser, um, and describe what you were doing or what you were attempting to do, what your goals are, and how you got to where you are. So this is an example of an actual support request that we received from one of uh, Schiphol's clients, the Children's Museum, where she was trying to update a form and wasn't getting the desired result. She gave us a link and she said, this is what I need. Please change this from X to Y. And we were able to move forward and take care of her request. Um, so it's important to be detailed. Yeah, so that's one of the things you'll run into. I'm gonna stay seated because every time I try to stand up and be cool, things just go wrong. <laughs> so I'll just stay here. Um, what we have here is an example, uh, Shannon, lovely. Shannon sent over a support request and we've worked with them for a little while. And so they kind of have a good idea of how to reach out to get what they need quickly. Um, as part of managing a website, you are often the person who has to deal with putting content on the site and that's when things start to go wrong because you're the person who interacts with the site the most. A lot of times we find that the person who interacts with the site, with the, site the most uh, may be new or may not be technically savvy. Like they're really great at writing on paper and in Word and it's like, oh, you want me to do what and put it where and click who? Mm -hmm. And that becomes an issue so things break. Um, one of the, when something goes wrong and you can't undo it and you can't fix it and you have to reach out to someone, don't worry, you're not being judged. They just want to know what happened. And if you can tell them what happened without them having to search event logs, you can help yourself and, your, um, and get your report or your request answered quickly. So one of the things she did basically was just describe what happened. She gave us some backstory and, and Carrie walked us through this. So that's an effective way to get what you need. Uh, from a support request, especially if you're in the middle of doing something and you just need to get it up. And that's a great segue into content. Um, if you, once your site is live, the most you'll do to it afterwards is add content. You won't mess with it structurally too much. You've already walked through that process and in, um, in the build and the go live and talked about what you want your site to do. And now you're in the, the throes of making it do what it was designed to do. And the biggest part of that is content. I wish there was a tip or a hack for content, but there is no shortcut. It's one of those things you have to do. Um, it's king. It's what drives people to your site. It's what keeps people on your site. It's what informs people about your organization, gives them information, resources, and uh, basically it's the online presence that's it, it's your online presence. If you have a brick and mortar location, that's great, but if people can't get to you, this is where, where they'll get to you. Um, content does a lot for your website. It, I think the most important thing it does is help establish your legitimacy. I mean, before, when people, when you hear about something, the first thing you do is go look at them online, and if they have a questionable website, you feel like maybe they're a bit sketchy. <laughs> like, something's going on here, unless it's very much, I need to go here and get what I need. But if it's a beautifully designed website that people respond to, um, or that you can submit something to and someone responds to you, you feel confident, you, you have a little more faith in that business and you trust them. And your content is a big part of helping you do that. Um, it also boosts your SEO. Mm -hmm. So if you have no words on your site, um, not only will people be very frustrated as to why you even have a site, but Google can't see you. So, um, and the other thing, so even though content like I said, there are no shortcuts, and you've already seen the slide. I just ruined surprise. There's just no element of surprise. Um, so one of the uh, – Jaunty Bowles was our SEM manager for the lovely Caitlin took over, and one of the things that she would always say is content is king, and not just because she was, like, all in love with SEO, but because it's real. Um, one of the things to contribute to your content, or the thing to contribute to your content, is to post consistently. So – 
post something if you have short information anytime something is going on in your organization a new hire um, a new computer someone brought their cat that day <laughs> it's a it's, new venture a, and, a new and, campaign that you guys are working on a new function of your website sure. a new phone number a new email address those are uh, things that you want to post to your site and announce that you have them because your community is out there and I know we get in the habit of interacting with people face to face or in our other smaller networks and maybe you said it on Twitter and maybe you said it on Facebook or maybe you handed out flyers or sent out a mailer but there's an online community that that also needs to be addressed and this is one of the ways to stay in touch with them so posting consistently doesn't necessarily mean posting frequently it just means posting consistently so writing some content adding a photo making an announcement um, on a regular basis so either it's weekly or bi-weekly or once a month mm -hmm. letting people know when to expect to hear from you is a good way to keep your site traffic up and keep people coming and keep your keep your community engaged another way to keep your community engaged and help relieve some of the um, the stress of managing a website because oftentimes the person who manages the website has other roles because I mean as important as it is now I think some people still forget um, what responsibility is involved with maintaining a website and so they have this person who also answers the phones and also you know bakes the cookies and they may also be doing the offline marketing as well right and the online marketing is just part of their their job right and, and instead of part of the job it's a job in itself and so one of the ways to relieve some of the stress from that person is to ask the, com the community to contribute that's a great way to do it and it's also another way to get other people involved because if I wrote a post on when I was an intern and I wrote a post for the Shippel blog the first thing I did was email all my friends and so that was like 300 more people who didn't know about Shippel who knew about it then your community will do that for you too so remember that you're not alone if you are the person managing a website. Reach out to your community. I know it's scary because you're like, I don't know what they're going to do or what they're going to write. That's the beautiful part of your website. You get to control those permissions. So people can write things, post it right to your website, but it has to go through a vetting process where it stays in pending or something like that until you get a chance to review it or someone else gets a chance to review it and post it live and get the okay. Um, and I know that just seems like more work. Um, it's if you go to a if I give Carrie my Twitter password and say go for what you know I can't do something today I trust her to not be ridiculous I'm not gonna be ridiculous see that's all I need <laughs> you have people trust like that. me <laughs> you have people like that in your community that you can trust and those will be the first people that you call on to help you contribute to your website and help you develop that um, develop those consistent posts that keeps you engaged and it also reaches out to other people in their network that helps strengthen your organization um, the last one is it's a bit of a hack and we don't recommend it all the time because it's not original but it is helpful sometimes you have a, a rough week a busy week but you can pull in um, you can use RSS feeds to pull in posts from other websites and it'll appear on your website as fresh content uh, for your website uh, one of the I guess the downfalls of it is that it's duplicate content that Google already knows about the good mm -hmm. part is it shows up on your website you click to it and it goes to that other person's site so it's not like you're stealing content mm -hmm. and you you're sharing link love that's how you play nicely on the internet so these are things you want to know about when it comes to managing a site especially after go live and keeping it fresh with content another part of that See, this is a routine because I would forget about the clicker and just all kinds of things. Taking care of the technical part. <laughs> technical bits. Um, one of the best things you can do as a person who manages a website is discover and use your site's best features. Sexy LOL cat displaying all of their best features. Um, if your photo is, I mean, photo, if your website is really great at displaying photos because you have a layout that supports. Um, visual that appeals to people visually then consistently update your site with photos and that'll be like a draw so if you if you do rely on 
RSS feeds from other sites, maybe you can change out the photo mm -hmm. and still have it linked to the other site mm -hmm. with that content. But if, you're, if your site is really good at displaying photos, make it work for you. Um, if your site is really great at maintaining data or collecting visitor information, use that to your advantage. So say you don't have the budget for a beautiful new design, your site's a few years old, and people go to it and they still sign up and they sign up for your newsletter and your website is the place that collects your newsletter information, then use that to your advantage. Export that, um, that information and put it into a nice newsletter campaign. Um, there's the plenty of different newsletter tools. client. Uh, newsletter client. There's mm -hmm. different tools that you can engage with. Um, we use Campaign Monitor a lot at Shipple. We also have clients that engage with Constant Contact. There's Mailchimp. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one called My Emma, I think. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. And uh, you can use those tools, other tools, along with your main website to engage with your. Uh, your community or your site visitors. Right, and that's that's especially if your job, if your website doesn't do a very good job at displaying content very well, but it collects user information like nobody's business. <laughs> so collect it, export it, and use it to your advantage. Manage your users through your website. Email them, reach out to them through your website, and it may not bring them to your website, but it's still you interacting with them <laughs> and using your website's best feature. Um, if your website helps you manage event registration. Like, um, I know a lot of tendency sites can collect registration information and help you. Like, when you can have your roster, you can print name badges. Invoices. Collect payments. Um, that type of thing. If your site is really good at doing that and you have a lot of events, use that part. Don't worry about trying to make pretty photos and make your site do something that it wasn't built to do because it will always, always, always end up with you calling support. I don't know what happened, it just broke. <laughs> it's like, what were you trying to do? Well, I was trying to put this photo in here with this dancing lady, and then it all just kind of went crazy. That's not using one of your site's best features, but if it collects that information very well, do that. If it processes forms very well. Um, I know some sites can be inconsistent with notifying people, um, or some sites don't have the capability of notifying you when a form gets processed and you have to go to the site to collect that information. That's not really one working for you, um, where it collects it and it stays there. Mm -hmm. um, it's really useful, or a good example of a site that processes forms is one where when the form is submitted, someone in your company or several people in your company are alerted, so you get a notification and you don't have to go to the site and log in and go through all these mm -hmm. technical things that maybe you're not familiar with. It goes right to your inbox. Mm -hmm. You can take that information and contact that person. That eliminates um, excessive phone calls about the same thing for someone in your organization to collect information that can be easily collected online. And I think, I mean, how many of you have called, <laughs> how many of you get calls about uh, random things that can easily be answered through your website or, or just through a contact form? I know um, another example from the Children's Museum, they do birthday parties and people would have to call in to, um, to set up a birthday party. And I'm like, what, do we, what are some of the reasons they call you for? Like, well, to kind of tell us when, when they want to have it and find out if those dates are available, to um, tell us how many people will be there, to um, give us their name, address, and phone number, and to make the initial payment. And we're like, we can make your site do that. And they have been doing this for several years. And we're like, we can make your site do that. What are some other things? Booking field trips. I'm like, what are they contacting you for? And it's some similar information. So you can set up some forms to reduce those phone calls and maybe have that much more bandwidth for that person to, to do some other things that maybe aren't getting done or that may be suffering because they're having to do something that can be easily done by your website. So as a person who manages a website, you might want to find out what the best features or what your site does well and make it work for you. And finally, tips and hacks for your website. So we talked about keeping up with your content because it drives traffic and helps improve your SEO. Um, one of the tips or tricks we thought would be beneficial is to learn how to bring in content from other sites via an RSS feed. Um, another thing is to find free SEO scrubs of your website, or is it Keyword Finder? We have a keyword analyzer. Yeah. A keyword analyzer. You can go through your site. I mean, as a site manager or as a person who is responsible for what happens on the website, um, part of your responsibility include, in, you know, 
including maintaining content, it's also monitoring the site's traffic and performance. And a lot of that can be determined by uh, what you actually have on the site. And then helping to define the goals of your website or your business organization and your analytics is another way to do that. So if you're supposed to be getting people to come in and look at pictures of LOL cats and you have pictures of LOL cats there but nobody's coming, what's the deal? Um, you can do like a search of your site and see what, what could be going wrong and where people are going when they get there. That's also mm -hmm. found through analytics. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then modifying your content based on that. And there's a lot of free tools that you can use to do this. The uh, keyword analyzer that uh, we mentioned is a free tool that you can get off of Shipple's website. Um, Kaylin, is it shipple.com slash SEM tools slash keyword? SEM hyphen tools slash keyword analyzer? Oh, and then all the tools are listed on that page. And so, one more time, that's shipple.com <laughs> slash SEM dash tools. We and practiced that. Yes, we did. The keyword analyzer helps you plug in your URL and it spits out all of the keyword phrases that are available on whatever page that you're analyzing. And it may, you can amend your content based on those recommendations. And those are free tools that you can use. And there's other free tools there that uh, you can make use of. Um, obviously, you can engage with us, but you don't need to. We offer the free tools and they're there for you to use. The analytics, uh, we recommend Google Analytics, which is also a free tool. Yep. Um, it's a super analytic tool that you can use to monitor your website visits and website traffic. There are other tools that you can use. Um, one, of the, well, one thing I want to note about um, I me mean, working on the end where you're responsible for putting in this information and seeing what people are doing and getting people to come to the site because that's why you're putting stuff there. I think one of the difficult ta one of the difficult things you're tasked with is proving what the site's doing, and and you know I guess making sure you keep <laughs> you keep your your job as your a website marketing budget. <laughs> keep your budget, um, and that's difficult to do. And I think a lot of people look to certain tools to determine that. What the analytics tools will do is show you how people are behaving on your site, and then it's up to you to adjust. And it, so what that means is not to forget uh, what you do know about marketing and what you have learned about PR. The analytics tools can seem intimidating, but just know when you look at it, it's telling you just what people are doing on your site. Mm -hmm. And you manipulate your site or manipulate your site's content to help get people to do what you want them to do. And you basically just test it and see what works. If you look at your analytics and something is working, keep doing that or do more, do more things similar to it. And if something's not working, don't be afraid to ditch that idea and go with something else. One of the things that you can test drive is you can create a marketing campaign, send it out to your community, and then look at your analytics to see, did, they, did that campaign bring people back to the site? And what did they do on the website when they came? Is there a specific goal that you wanted them to, to do? Like, did you want them to submit a contact form to get more information? Or did you want them to register for a specific event? And so those, that's how, an example of how you can use the tools in conjunction with your website. And so there's, there's different options available. And then um, as far as managing visitor data within your site, that goes back to exporting that information. One, I mean, knowing that your site can collect this information and knowing what action a person needs to perform on the site in order for you to collect this information is important. Um, so if you're managing a website, a lot of times what happens after the site goes live, they're like, yay, my site's live, I'm excited, I'm gonna put some content in help me put some content in, and then maybe you're learning piece by piece how to do different things. It's a great idea to, to set up about a week of training to get familiar with your site, get to know what it can do, and then make it do those things. Mm -hmm. Because especially if you can collect user information, which is I think an important part of managing a website. Like you, you wanna know who was there, what they were doing, and how you can engage them on another level, mm -hmm. be a phone call, um, maybe they're a sales lead, maybe they're potential volunteers, mm -hmm. maybe they're potential inten attendees to an event. Or they could be a customer. Or, yeah, customers. And so, or maybe they're an upset person in not knowing that they've performed this action on your site and you can reach out to them. Or you have not knowing that you have their information or another way to reach out to them via, say they yelled at you on Twitter about something and you actually have an email address in your site because they, they've been active on your site, you can find it and reach out to them in a more, I guess, 
private environment and, and connect with them in a way that maybe they weren't expecting. And so finding out what actions a person performs on your site to help you collect their information is an important function of managing a website. Also making your site alert you when things happen. Um, there are a range of tools you can use to make your site alert you when things happen. For example, well, I think contact forms are automatic. Um, there are other things that you can use. So for example, if someone, if you reach out to, to your community to help you contribute content, you can get an alert on your, you know, an email alert when someone posts content. A lot of times you can see the actual content within the email. Um, I think, what else can you do? Uh, get notifications when people register um, as uh, users on the site. Mm -hmm. um, notifications when people register for events on the site. It depends on the software that your site is using. Each software tool is going to offer different uh, capabilities and customizations. And while there may not be uh, certain things that came with your site, there may be plugins or applications that work very well that were designed to work with the platform that your site runs on. Mm -hmm. For example, WordPress. Um, as someone who has to enter content a lot, WordPress has an editorial calendar, which I find very useful. So finding out those types of tools, um, and that can even be found through the company who helped you build your website. You can reach out to them and find out certain tools to help you do your job better, mm -hmm. especially if a big part of your job is managing a website and it's only, it's not seen as a big part of your job because you do other things. And then measuring your performance at a glance. Oh, wait, we I want to say about, one more thing. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> it was related to, um, to making your website alert you. In addition to getting email alerts, you can make your website, you can manage your website from your phone through certain applications depending on what they are. And I think that's really important, especially if you um, are the marketing person and you have an event that evening and people, people, interact with your site all the time. It doesn't go, it doesn't shut down when you leave work, which is, right. it can be burdensome, but it doesn't shut down when you leave work. And being able to inter do certain things through your phone, who was really happy when Facebook started letting you update your privacy settings on your phone, right? That's what, that's what that's like. So it's, it's frightening and all you, all you think about is getting home so you can log in and take whatever someone did or whoever someone is or whatever someone can see off of your page. It can be that frightening when you're the marketing director and responsible for a website and someone's on there posting ugly comments or stealing uh, or spamming your job board or taking information. You want to be aware of that and you want to be able to respond quickly. So knowing how, knowing if your site can alert you via your phone or uh, knowing if you can manage certain functions through your phone is, Im is important to know. And those are things you want to ask early on in the mm -hmm. development process. Mm -hmm. So for the last tip that we have is measuring your performance. We spoke a little bit about measuring your analytics earlier. Uh, you can also use other tools like if you allow comments on your website to see who's coming to your website, who's leaving comments, and uh, who is joining as a subscriber on your website. And depending on your software platform, Drupal works a little bit differently and WordPress has options as well. Tendency allows you to do different things. Uh, it just depends on what software tool you're using um, to be able to measure all of these things. Do you have any other final measure things? How are we on time? About 12 minutes. 12 minutes. It's a good time to take questions. Okay. Well, I think we are at a good point where we can take any questions that you guys have with regard to anything that we talked about or anything that we didn't cover and you would like to know more about. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we use Tendency, as Katrina knows, to uh, do our event calendar and our customers can come in and sign up for the cooking class that we offer. And uh, the cooking instructor wanted to go in and grab all of the emails from anyone who has ever signed up for a cooking class. There was a um, kind of argument whether or not we could sign them up from that email address and start sending them our weekly newsletter. Um, is that kind of, you know, because people didn't opt in necessarily just by giving, you know, their email address for the class, they just opted in to receive notifications about the class. Is that kind of a no-no, so to say, you know, for taking their email address and then in essence Signed up it's definitely a gray area. So yeah. the question I'm going to repeat is, folks came to the website registered for uh, a specific event or function, 
and submitted their email address, is it okay to take their email address that they gave for this reason and use it for a different reason as sending them a newsletter? Um, we definitely don't recommend that you take the email that they gave for the event registration and put it in the, the email distribution list without their permission. Uh, you are able to email the, in tendency, you are able to email the registrants directly um, and you can send them direct communication that says, thank you for registering. Um, we recommend or we suggest that you also sign up for our newsletter and here's the link to go do that. Okay. And that way they can uh, opt in themselves and when they receive the newsletter in tendency, they will also have the capability to opt out once they've gotten it if they chose right. they choose not to receive it anymore. Okay. Um, and another way to do that if you're concerned about um, someone not taking that next step and adding themselves to this additional newsletter um, on the sign up form where they register for the newsletter you can you can say you can indicate that you'll also receive notifications for this email newsletter um, you'll be able to opt out you know something like that So the question is, how does Shipple decide how to, which platform to use for a client coming in for a new website? It depends on the client's needs. Um, Shipple, like our mission and vision is to organize and connect the world's people and do good. And in order to do that, we have to give you something that that fits your needs. So if you happen to want to manage like memberships or um, you have events. You have events, and you want your site to perform certain functions. We may recommend a tendency website. If you say, you know, I just want to blog and I want it to look pretty, and you don't have a really specific idea of what you want to do, um, and you're okay with a template, and you have a small budget, we may recommend a WordPress site. If you need something, you have an extremely complex website uh, that has to do many things. Um, calendar events or take payments or um, manage subscribers, then we would recommend Drupal. Um, it's not for the faint of heart. No. <laughs> and so it depends on your needs and your budget. And um, a lot of times we may not be able to meet your needs or your budget and we, we, we will recommend someone who we feel can. There was another question? Mine actually wasn't a question. It was a comment to the previous question. Oh, yeah? Where people are signing up, she could just put a simple checkbox there where mm -hmm. they're directly signing up, saying, I wish to receive the newsletter, kills mm -hmm. two birds with one stone. Yeah. That way you'll, you could have that go into another list, so you'll have the people that signed up for the event, and then those that agree to accept the newsletter, so yep. you don't make the end user go through another step of popping out. Sure. Um, for the admin, you would then, uh, on a technical level, in tendency, have to create a custom registration form that would allow you to have those customizations. But that is a good solution. More questions? Yeah. Yes, sir. Is it still customary? If you use RSS feeds, um, do you need to ask permission to use the content, or is it pretty much, if it's on there, it's open to be used? As sometimes long as... It, sometimes like, I've heard to email and ask people to use the content. I would say if it's an RSS feed and you're and it's available for you to opt in, as long as when you click on the content, it goes to their site and not to your site. Like uh, for example, you, I, Carrie wrote a post, and I was like, oh, that's a good post on my own feed site. on her own site. <laughs> I'm like, that's a great post. I want to use that. I'm low on time. I'll pull it in and. Um, and put in my own picture, and when you click on it, it goes to a page that I wrote that says, oh, and I wrote this post, click here. And then it, well, no, it wouldn't even click here. No. No, I don't think you can. I think when you pull in content from another site, it automatically, like, that's the way to play nicely on the internet, that if it links to their site. If you're pulling the feed, it's gonna pull in the, the link to the content or display a portion of the content. If you click more, it's gonna take you back to the site. It's different than, uh, publish or copying portion of the content and attributing it back to the website, which is another way that you can play nice. Um, I'm not familiar I'm with having to ask anyone. permission. Yeah. Does Does anyone have any recommendations okay, one, on that? One of the things that I would bring up is uh, due to the group uh, Right Haven out of Nevada that's been suing all these people that have been 
doing RSS feeds and uh -huh. been pulling in from other sites where those sites have been pulling the data off of news agencies. Okay. Updates and that, and they've been sued. Uh, what's happened so far is most of them have been thrown out of court due to the fact that Right Haven was not the original copyright owner of that con gym, mm. and only the original owner of that con gym could sue. Right. So it's probably good practice to ask mm -hmm. if you're allowed to use that. As Michael was saying, uh, it's better to ask and not have problems and then just go ahead and pull that in and use it and then be faced with a cease and desist. What I do know about some some sites, because like I said, it's impossible to come up with everything in the world on your own or every great idea, and maybe someone else did it first and did it better than you. Um, a lot of times those people will have information about how to use their content already on their site. Um, and there's also a simple rule, you can post it, make sure it links back to their site, make sure you make it clear that it is not your content. And if someone contacts you and asks you to take it down, take it down. And that's, that's a very nice way to play on the internet. 